Record to the cloud. Okay. Share screen. I can do this. I'm a professional. Professional what? That's the question. Right. <clears throat> so just to recap from yesterday. So we had just finished, basically, just to remind you. Um, oh, there's someone in the waiting room. I did notice that one. Um, we just finished looking at all of these uh, functions. So we just looked at uh, all the dynamic UI type stuff. So we looked at render UI, we looked at conditional panel, and we looked at uh, using require and validate, which are all ways of kind of making your user interface a bit friendlier and a bit nicer. So today we're going to finish session two. There isn't a huge amount of session two left, so we're going to do that. And then we're going to do session three. Session three is by far the hardest session, so I think it's all to the good that we've got a slightly more time for that than we have for any of the other sessions. Um, so where we're up to now is we're just going to finish off session two with looking at doing your own uh, UI. So up till now, we've just relied on the, um, the sidebar layout uh, function, which makes those common garden shiny applications that you'll be familiar with. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can actually, um, you can build them up, you know, you can build fairly arbitrary things um, using uh, just these functions that I'm going to show you now. Um, so basically, there are two functions that you need uh, when you're building uh, your own user interface. So you don't use sidebar layout. We'll look at the code in a moment. So you get rid of sidebar layout and you just lay the whole thing out yourself. So the first function that you need is, is fluid row. And what fluid row does is it, it draws a row across the screen and you stack them on top of each other so and you can split them up so you have one here and then they each have columns inside them so you might have a row with say three columns and another row with two and so on and so on and that's how you build the whole user interface um, you can build pretty much anything out there are a couple of little tweaks that i'm not going to show you but if you just read in your own time you'll see that you can actually do things that are a little bit clever than what i'm showing you now but i'm just trying to show you the basics really um, and the way that you define the columns is, um, oh, I'll just pause. There's a question in the chat about, am, am I am I lagging? Is that, is anyone else having that problem? Or is it Alex's end? I don't know it's the fine answer, that's bad. Yeah, no, sorry, I think it's you, Alex. Um, right, yes. So. The way you split up the fluid rows is using columns and you can give them widths and the columns add up to 12. So you can have like four of three or two of six or three and a nine or whatever it is. And this is a, a yet another thing that we're seeing. This isn't um, shiny. This isn't something that shiny is invented. This is bootstrap. So if, you, if you're if you on your trails and you're interested in um, learning more about kind of the web stuff and how it all works, you should know that shiny is, is based on the bootstrap framework, which includes this concept. I think when Shiny first launched, it was based on version Bootstrap version two, and then for quite a long time, I, th I think it was based on version three, and I think they may have just switched to four, but I might have got that wrong. They might be still on three. They're either on three or four, um, and I think they might be either thinking about going to four or they just have gone to four. To be honest, I don't know a huge amount about it, but I'm sure if you're interested in such things, you can have a bit of a dig around and uh, and have a look. Being being honest, kind of. Making things look nice is not really not really in my skill set, so I don't I don't tend to know a huge amount about these things. But um, so this is just an example, just to show you how the code works. So I think I mentioned this yesterday, although I may not have done. So if I didn't, then I'm mentioning it now. You always need fluid page. Well, you don't always need fluid page to be honest, but with this you need fluid page. Fluid page does a lot of stuff um, that's really important um, that you need. I can't remember what it all is, but it's it's uh, it's very important. I think it does some like CSS or it, it, it does some important stuff. So if you miss it out, if you just go to straight to fluid row, then it doesn't look as good. So you need you need to wrap everything in fluid page. There are other ways of laying applications out that come with their own fluid page equivalent, then you don't need it. So but you'll see those as you go through. But in this case, you certainly need it. And then inside your fluid page, as I mentioned, you just all you're doing is you're stacking, it's like laying bricks. You're just stacking the fluid rows on top of each other and you're just defining the width. So this code here generates this, uh, this, I may as well just zoom in, I'm wasting a lot of the screen, aren't I? Generates this down here. So as you can see here, this is a very simple application. So you've got two columns of six and six. So as you can see, this clearly obviously divides it in half. And then you've got below that, 
So this is the first row, and then the second row is two columns, uh, and you've got a thin one here, so that's width of three, and then nine. And as I say, you can have as many as you like, and you can do what you like with them, but they have to add up to 12. That's just, that's the way that it works. Um, the only thing that's a bit tricky about this sometimes, and you'll find this in your own application, is if you have uh, something that's quite short next to something that's quite tall, the fluid row, I mean, you probably guess this, will just take up the, the width, of the, the height of the, of the tall thing. So you've got, say, a short thing here and then a tall thing there and a short thing there. It kind of looks a bit strange because you've got a lot of wasted space. So sometimes it's useful to kind of rearrange things or maybe use a different way of laying things out um, because it doesn't really handle that very gracefully uh, because of the fact that it's like laying bricks. So there's, there's no way around that, really. But there are other ways of doing it that you can uh, think about. Um, so that's it, basically. So that's um, it's it's surprisingly useful. Um, it's always good to, you know, you don't want to be stuck in kind of sidebar layout forever. Um, so I think it is quite a useful skill to have this. So that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to take the thing we built yesterday. So let's just, uh, oh, I picked that up again. I always do that. Uh, let's just take the thing we built yesterday. And we're going to... Um, <clears throat> we're going to lay it out using this. So we're going to get rid of the side by layout and we're going to lay it out uh, in the other way. So, uh, which of the many R Studio windows that I've got open do I want? It's not that one over there, is it? No, it's this one. I think. Yep, yeah, there it is. And we want to be. Oh, no, I suppose we want to be in temp, really, don't we? Let's go to temp, which is where I was yesterday. <clears throat> oh, and I've got too many columns. I've not just get rid of a column. Put them back yesterday afternoon when I was writing my own code. Okay, yeah, this is where we're up to yesterday. So yeah, yeah. So as I say, so I don't know what you're doing. I don't know whether you've got a folder for each or whatever it is, um, but the 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 correct answer to this question is in uh a and e third so at a minimum you want to be using the application that's currently in a and e second if you don't have your own um and as always there is some code to help you um let me just open that in this other window over here getting a bit confused with all the different code windows um Let's just pop this out. So this is a and e code underscore third dot r. So you've got this in the repo. Um, oh, yes. And I think yesterday I um, put them next to each other like that, didn't I? There it is. I mean, there's not a lot in this here, really. This is all we're going to do. We're just going to do this. Uh, this is just some other stuff for you to mess around with. Uh, I'll decide um, how much time I'm going to spend on that um, when we've got a bit further through. But that's just some of the other ways that you can lay things out. Everyone happy so far? Shout up in the chat if I've lost you. So that's what you do. So we're going to replace, as I say, with this sidebar layout. We're going to get rid of all of that. And we're going to replace it with this. A column of three and nine is roughly equivalent to a sidebar layout. Um, so we're going to do that. Uh, if you feel like you know what you're doing and you just want to ignore me, then please do. Uh, or you can just have a look at what I'm doing and, uh, and follow along. Um, <clears throat> right. So... Um, and again, obviously, this is slightly artificial because in real life, you're not going to write an application and then destroy half of it. And then, you know, so this is we're sort of writing backwards. You would obviously just write it from scratch like this. So it's a bit of a weird example, this, but obviously this is just for teaching purposes. Um, OK, so these are the inputs, basically. So we want to keep them together. 
and this is the output just this tab set panel we don't need this main panel that's a, that's a, a function of sidebar layout so i think the easiest way of doing this and as i say this is not really a realistic task um is we're just going to get rid of all of the um functionality to do with sidebar layouts we're going to get rid of that get rid of that bracket which goes with it like that and then we're going to get rid of main panel as well because that's also part of um sidebar layout and that isn't that that bracket goes with there let's just get rid of this comment because it's got nothing to do whatsoever with the application um yeah sort of weirdly ugly that isn't it oh yeah that looks better i might just write a comment here just to just to keep me uh make it obvious where i am okay cool <clears throat> So as I say, you're going to need the fluid page. So we've got the fluid page up here. We can leave the title in. That's fine. That'll destroy a nice title for us. And then we're just going to use one fluid row. Um, again, in a more realistic example, you might do this more than once. You might have lots of stuff to lay out. Um, but we're just for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to do it with one. <clears throat> so we're going to have a fluid row here. And it's going to be made of two columns. Let's write the let's write the function argument out just for the sake of clarity. And then something goes there. And again, don't forget the commas in UI definitions. <clears throat> and then column width equals nine. I don't know why I wrote something. I would have been better writing inputs on my inputs. <coughs> Outputs. Like that. That's it, I think. Let's just make sure all the brackets match, which they don't. Uh, oh, no, I think it's just complaining because, yeah, because we haven't, we haven't rearranged it yet. So now we've done that, we can just take all the inputs and just put them inside that column. Again, obviously with columns between, uh, commas between them. So that goes there like that. And we can take all of the output stuff. What does that bracket match with? Oh yeah, that's right. And we can take all the output stuff and pick it up. Oh, missing a bracket. And put it in here. <coughs> like that. Yes, we just we've acquired an extra bracket somewhere. I've no idea where, but I'm sure I'm pretty sure that's right. <clears throat> okay, like that. And I think that's right. Does that look right? Fluid row, column width equals nine, blah blah blah. Yeah, looks good to me. Right, let's run it and see. Oh yes, I forgot the uh, I forgot the, the the code at the top. <clears throat> right, okay, that's my fault. Let's just um. <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry. That's this is my fault. I'm using the wrong code file. You're probably looking at a more sensible code file than this, but just in case you're not. Um, I'll put I'll put the stuff uh, on the screen so you can see it. <clears throat> um, just any second we want. So the first thing we need to do is just copy the data out and put it where I was just working. <clears throat> In there. And the second thing we need to do is just copy the data in. <clears throat> oh, actually, I'm I'm loading it from GitHub anyway, so we don't we need to worry about the data. Never mind. There. 
there. <clears throat> Oops. Done. Okay, right, should work now. <clears throat> Yeah, and there it is. So yeah, as you can see, this is pretty much the same as a sidebar layout. It actually doesn't look quite as good because sidebar layout has got the little nice grey um, boxes to it kind of makes thing make it look a bit kind of neater. But I um, don't know what the word is. It's a nicer design. Um, you can do that yourself. As I say, look at making things look nice is not not one of my consuming passions really. But if you're interested in doing that, the function you want is well panel. So you can use that to draw nice gray boxes around things. They are quite useful. UI design is useful. I'm just not very good at it, basically. Um, but it will just make a little, nice little uh, nice little box. And I've just realized I've hidden the chat with code. So I'm going to put it back up again in case anyone's saying anything. Right, that's that. So that's how you do that. So is everyone happy with that? That's how it works. As I say, you can build quite complicated things using that. And there's a couple of other tweaks which I'm not going to go into now. Um, but you can build quite large, complicated things just with those uh, with those two functions. Cool. OK, let's keep going then. So that's most of session two. Um, at the end of session two, I just want to just show you a couple of things. Um, just so you know, um, so, oh yes, and I've left some things in here for you as well to do, if you like. Um, and I think we did mention this actually yesterday, didn't we, about using Render UI to, um, to make the date range input dynamic. Um, so, oh, this hasn't got Render UI, has it? I think I'm using a fairly random code file. I'm sorry about that. I'm sure you all got the principle there. I think you're probably looking at a more up-to-date bit of code than I am, but the layout functions are the same. Um, so that's that. So do have a look at that in your own time if you wish to um, uh, just to get a bit of practice using render UI. Um, and the other thing I want to show you is I just want to show you some of the uh, some of the other functions that you can use to lay things out. Um, and there are examples within the um, within the repo, so I'll just show you them. And again, I mean, I partly included these just so you can just go away and look at them. It's always useful to have code, I think, that you can refer to that you understand. So if we just go to the repo, so obviously you've all got this code. Um, so. Um, Oh, no, maybe you haven't. No, sorry. No, maybe it's just dashboard you've got. No, it looks like you haven't got that. Okay, well, never mind. Well, let's just do it. That's fine. Um, so let's just let's just explore a few of these. Why not? I thought, as I say, I thought you'd have got examples, but evidently you don't. Um, so let's just have a go. Uh, which one should we do? Let's do maybe the top three, and I'll leave you to have a look at Navalis panel yourself. So split layout is fun. I mean, the, these functions, split layout is one of the kinds that you probably don't want to lay out your whole application with it because it's a bit crude. Um, it's it's more of something you can use within a larger uh, bit. So, you know, that's the thing about the UI functions in Chinese, you can sort of combine them. So you could combine stuff with fluid row and columns with split layout. Um, but you can just use them. It depends what you're doing. If you're doing something fairly simple, um, then um, it can work a bit better. Um, oh no, you know what? No, let's let, let's combine them. Actually, that's a better idea, isn't it? Should have said that in the first place. Let's add a split layout in here, just to demonstrate that principle. <clears throat> so we can just take this and put the inputs inside split layout like this. This is a sort of fairly realistic thing that you might do. No doubt that it's going to fail catastrophically the first time I press it because I've, I haven't thought of something. Oh, no, there it is. No, that's exactly what I wanted. Um, 
Who knew? Uh, oh, yeah, it's made a horrible mess. Um, yeah, that's not that's not really a... Or what it does is it divides it in half, and I suppose I hadn't really thought about just what a horrible mess that would make. Instead, let's get rid of the tab set panel. And replace that with a split layout. That'll, that'll make a more sensible application. So I say the point of doing this is just to kind of show you the way you can kind of combine things. So put that there like that. Oops. Get this here. Put that in there. Get rid of that. Get rid of some of these extra brackets that we don't need. There we go. That'll look a lot more sensible, I'm sure. <clears throat> Like that. So by default, it just splits the screen in half. So that can be quite useful, as you can see. That's a that's a quite a simple way of of uh, of you know using the space that you've got. Um, but I'm pretty sure you can also you can change the uh, the proportion of um, yeah cell widths. So you can uh, you can actually um, change the amount of space that each one gets. Uh, like you can see it just here like this. So let's just pop that in there just to uh, illustrate the point. So that's the art, I think, with uh, Shiny. That's the point I'm trying to make is a kind of layering them together and kind of using the using the uh, the different approaches. There's more than one way to skin a cat, basically, as there so often is with R. So let's just have a look at that one. That's going to make a very ugly output, I think, but you get the idea. And there it is. So now you can see it's, uh, it's divided up neatly for us. So that's that one. Uh, what else have we got? Vertical layout. I think we can probably just fairly easily just replace vertical layout in here like this. Like that. And have a look at that one. Close some of these. So vertical layout, as the name suggests, it just goes down, down the page, which uh, you want to do sometimes. Um, I forget. Is there anything clever you can do with vertical layout? I forget. Let's have a look. Mm, not really. So that's that. Uh, and then let's have a look at one of these ones. So navbar page and lavness panel are kind of a bit similar to each other, um, but they, they kind of give it. It's a different. It's the same sort of style, uh, but they just look a little bit different. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I don't particularly remember exactly the way that you draw it, so I'm just going to look it up. Um, Yeah, like this. Navbar page. So these are kind of whole applications, really. Um, well, they're ways of drawing. So it's a bit like it's more like a um, sidebar layout type function. This really. Um, so let's just show how this works. Um, so we would perhaps put these in here. Um, like that. And then put these in there, and that's a map. <clears throat> I 
And I just realised this isn't the correct label anymore. We require an extra bracket somewhere along the way. Okay, I think that should work. So yeah, so now bar panel uh, does something like this. Doesn't make a huge amount of sense for this application because we've got the inputs over here and the, and the graph separately, which is not particularly very good to use interface design, but it's just to show you the look of it really. So you get this nice, um, nice thing up here. Not this. Yeah, I suppose really that would have been better put in a in a um I wonder if I can just do it quickly. <clears throat> Probably would have looked better like this really. Column three. And then just take the inputs there. Like that. <clears throat> and then add another column and then add the navbar page inside the column. <clears throat> I can't, I can't think it was a sensible uh, value for that. I'm sure if it was a real application I would have a sensible value for it, but I can't really think at the moment, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> Oh yes, of course, I need another column, don't I? Column 9, comma. There we go, that's more like it. Sorry, I should have done that the first time, shouldn't I? So there you go, there's a pretty good example, actually. It took me two, two, took me two goes. Of how you can sort of combine these um yeah what would you write here i don't know what you would write here maybe you just wouldn't write anything i don't know uh it doesn't matter yeah so as you can see i've combined the fluid row in the column there so the inputs are laid out in a column and then the navbar page i put over here uh like this because obviously if you don't do that you end up with the inputs on a tab which doesn't really make a lot of sense from a ui point of view so that looks all right doesn't it given that i just made it up uh, I think that looks, that looks pretty okay. Okay, so that's all the layout. Well, that's not all the layout functions. There are lots of layout functions. I'm just showing you a few of them. Uh, there's another one here. This does a similar job to navbar page. It's just a, it's more of a design thing. Um, but there are quite a few, so I'd encourage you to just have a read of the of the documentation. Um, this is one of a big piece of advice I give to people actually who write in shiny. It, it's it's I don't know why a lot of people don't seem to know about this. Um, Quite often, people talk to me about user interface, and I say, "Oh, why don't you use such and such a, a, a um, you know function?" And they don't know about it, and it can save you a lot of time faffing around. If you know the exact function that you want, things like split layout, it's a lot easier sometimes to use a function in there rather than kind of cobbling it together yourself. So do have a read. Um, right, is everyone happy with that? So that was the sort of UI session, really. So now I feel like you know a decent amount about making your own UI, which is awesome. Cool. Okay, everyone's happy. Right. So that's it. So session three. Uh, as I say, we've got a decent chunk of time for session three, which is also good because it's um, by far the hardest session. So <clears throat> just forgive me one moment while I just change my slides over. So let's just close this window. And press run over here. <clears throat> and here we are. <clears throat> Let me just get the chat window back up on the screen so I can see it. Yep.
Right. Actually, sorry, I'm just going to pause one moment. Let me just, um, oops, wrong button. <clears throat> Let me just think through the, just the timings of breaks and stuff, because we're, we're not a million miles away from cup of tea time, are we? So let me just think about. Um, <clears throat> where we are in that. Um, so we've got our markdown, we've got shiny dashboards, and we've got just some other bits and pieces. Yeah, OK. Yeah, we'll probably go until maybe a bit after 11 and then we'll and then we'll have a break and uh, I'll just I'll try and find a, a clean place to leave off. <clears throat> OK, right. So session three. So in session three, uh, we're going to do two things, really. Um, but there's quite a lot to them, so they'll take a while. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at making our markdown reports from Shiny which is something that people very commonly want to do when they start using Shiny, is they build all this stuff and then they immediately start wondering themselves, how can I get people to um, to download a report? And um, people are often uh, quite critical of dashboards and say that they are not, that the interactivity basically is frequently lost on the audience uh, and the audience don't really want to interact with a data set at all they just want to print their report off and go um, and I think that is that is true in in lots of uh, in lots of cases I think so of this a lot of the stuff that I've done I think the most popular bit has probably been the, uh, the, the, the the print thing partly just because you can't really take a dashboard to a meeting can you I think it, it's it's partly that it's partly just people want just to print seven pieces of paper out and take it and sit there um, whereas it, it's just not intuitive really to do that with something that you're interacting with. Um, anyway, so we're going to do that. I'm going to warn you now that I'm going to teach you the sort of hard way of doing this. Uh, there's an easy way, which I, which I used to do myself back in the day, naively. Um, I, but I'm not even going to tell you what it is. You'll probably stumble across it on the internet if you haven't already. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to show you because I just think, although it's easier than what I'm going to show you, it's a lot more limited and um, you may as well just do it properly. It, it's just uh, having realized my mistake and having thought to myself, oh, I should never have done it this really. Um, I never, I always do it properly now. I never, never take the shortcut way. Um, so I'm just telling you that I'm deliberately teaching you something a little bit harder than, uh, than the simplest way of doing it. But that is entirely intentional. You probably trip over on the internet and go, oh, yes, I see. That is a lot easier than what I've been doing. But <clears throat> I prefer my way. So I'm going to show you my way. Then we're going to look at Shiny Dashboard, which is a package um, for Shiny, which um, it's mainly just skins it, to be honest. Um, but it does also give you some extra functionality, which we're going to look at. Though. It does some extra stuff. But it is largely a cosmetic upgrade. I've debated with myself when I first put this in as to whether I should cover it because it's, I can't quite decide how important it is when it is mainly just cosmetic um, but arguably cosmetics are quite important in the world of dashboards I don't know really um, I did decide to put it in the, in the end partly just because I build everything everything I build I build in this so I thought well it seems silly to spend my entire job building stuff with something and then never showing anyone how you use it in the training um, but if you've got an opinion about this and you think it's silly and you think, oh, I would have much rather learned something uh, more to do with the interactivity or, you know, something like that. And there's because there's loads of things I haven't shown you, then please either tell me or just put it in the evaluation or whatever, um, because I have wrestled with this uh, very debate myself. And at the end, I'm going to show you how to interact with the shiny plot. I'm not really going to try and teach you that because, to be honest, it is quite hard. So I'm not really expecting you to go, oh, yes, I totally get this and go away and do it because it is quite hard. Um, I more just want you to see it and understand that it's possible and see the code um, just to inspire you. Um, because I think <clears throat> that's one of the real um, 
uh, that's a real untapped source of power i think within shiny is that you can make a lot of the th a lot of the outputs in shiny are interactive so you can interact with plots you can interact with with tables you know all that kind of thing and because obviously you're programming you know this isn't like a sort of it, it's not using pre-canned uh, routines like other uh, BI tools. The potential to interact with with things is is very great, uh, and there's some quite neat examples actually on the R Studio website where they where they, they have some quite neat uh, ways of interacting with things. <clears throat> but if you can imagine it in Shiny, basically you can build it, and so I think interactivity, although it is at the harder end of things. I think it's it's worth thinking about as just so you got it in the back of your head so you can think you know oh you know if i could interact with this plot what would i make it do what would i make a click do so i want to show you that and you can go away look at the code and uh, have a think about it <clears throat> okay right our markdown so our markdown is a little complicated partly to be honest because not only do you have to know a bit about shiny you have to know a bit about about our markdown which is partly why I do say that the prerequisites for this course are a little bit higher than they otherwise would have been because I want people to either have come across these concepts already or be reasonably able to pick them up um, because otherwise you, I don't think you'll really follow. Um, <clears throat> but basically the correct, the, correct the, the, the way that I'm saying you should do this is using parameterized R markdown. Um, so if you haven't seen parameterized R Markdown before, then you're going to have a crash course in it now. And if you have, then um, you'll, you'll already know about this. Um, so for those of you who haven't, what parameterized R Markdown is basically um, is it's in it was in the R Mark. I don't know if anyone came went to the R Markdown workshop at the NHS conference, but I helped at that, and it it, it was covered in that. Um, it's a way basically of rerunning a report with different values and getting a different report back. So at its simplest level, you have a report and you define like say, you know, one variable in the top, like in a healthcare example, it might be like a, I don't know, like a, an area like Mansfield. So you'd, you'd have the parameters Mansfield and then the report would talk about Mansfield. And then someone else says, well, I'm not interested in Mansfield. I want to know about Newark and Sherwood. Then you change the parameter at the top to Newark and Sherwood and you rerun the report and you get a totally different output out. So it's just a way of passing a variable through an R Markdown report and having that variable affect the stuff that comes out. Um, and that's something that you can do in, you can just do it in raw R Markdown just by typing stuff in. You can just type Mansfield or whatever it is, uh, which is very neat and useful. Uh, and you can also do cool things like you can loop through it and you know all that kind of thing. Um, but you can also do it in Shiny. So you can make Shiny do the pr parameterized R Markdown for you. And that's what we're doing here. Um, so that's the crash course over. Um, so basically what that means in practice is, uh, th this, um, this server code here. So the, the UI code is very simple. It's just, it's just download button. Now the download button function is useful. I'll just flag this up. You can do lots of things with the download button. It basically produces a button. And if you press that button, it runs the code in here in output dollar sign download, you see this, this name, you know, as always is here. So it r runs the code in here and the code will always return a file and it will download the file to the browser. It will tell the browser, get that file. So you can use it to download like data sets. So that's something that people want to do sometimes. Um, so they might do some stuff and then say, oh, well, whatever the data is, I want to download it. Um, that kind of thing. So it's not just for our markdown, it's for anything that anything that produces a file, basically. And obviously our markdown is one of those things. Um, so that's the UI and the server basically is just our markdown. So you'll 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 recognize this function, I would imagine, from the world of our markdown. This this function just tells um, R to render a, to render an R markdown with this file name. Um, the key thing being here with parameters. So we're going to pass these parameters in. Sorry, I just put my phone on silent. <clears throat> we're going to pass these parameters in and they're generated here. So this is this is the trick with Shiny is, uh, and again, this is, a, this is a simple example. Uh, well, it's a simple example. I suppose it's a fairly realistic one. But my point being is you can have much more complex parameters. You don't have to just pass in a load of reactive inputs. 
you could pass all manner of things in there. You could pass, you know, like um, some sort of cleaned up, you know, uh, set of input, you know, whatever it is. Some sort you can process is my point, um, the stuff that goes in. Um, so Shiny will figure out what the, what the parameters are, put them in a list, and then you can just pass it straight in. Um, and I'm not going to insult anyone's intelligence by pretending that I understand all this code. I don't, to be quite honest. Uh, well, I thought I'm saying that. I kind of half do, to be honest, I think. Uh, this is important. I mean, just copy this. I'm not saying you need to understand it, because I think when I started using it, I didn't understand it. So it's not really important you understand it, to be honest, because I cut and pasted it for a long time. I, the reason why this is here is because all it's saying is I want to start fresh. I don't want any of the stuff in this session that I'm currently in to affect what's coming next. Um, and I think that can be more or less important depending on what you're doing, but it's just, a, it's just a good way of doing it. If you're doing parameterize our markdown, you start with a clean sheet basically. And it's important to know, it's not important to know exactly what this, all this is doing, but it's important to know that the, the, the sheet is clean because we're going to have to load everything back in when we get there, as you'll see in a moment when we look at the R markdown file. Um, <clears throat> And then this. So this just basically says, take take the thing that you just um, made and copy it here, which is an argument to here. So as I say, I think I feel like I half understand this. It doesn't really matter how it all works. I don't think it's just if you oops, if you copy this and you change the parameters, and you you know if you make sure all the file names and everything are all correct in it it will work and i wouldn't i wouldn't tell yourself to not worry too much about exactly what the file i think this creates like a temporary file i think that's what it's for i think that's right this is or something i don't know, I forget exactly to be honest but anyway that's how it works um <clears throat> and again obviously you've got this code in the repo so you can just take away and copy it and change it which is why i've been doing it for years same piece of code <clears throat> okay, so that's the shiny bit. That's the server thing. So now I just want to show you that, oh, because obviously we're going to have an R markdown report as well. That's obviously key. Um, so in the report, this, for those of you, again, this is the crash course in, our, in parameterize R markdown coming back again. This is how we just set up the parameters in the R markdown bit. So this is in the YAML right at the top. And you just write params with a colon, and then it's indented. And then we're going to just set everything to NA. Now, you wouldn't do this normally with R Markdown, because obviously normally you'd just be typing into it, so you wouldn't, it wouldn't be NA. Um, <clears throat> we have to write something, and it's all just going to get copied over anyway. Um, so I think if you set this to a value in the Shiny, I think Shiny will just scrub over it and just put its own value in it. But I don't really know. But don't do that anyway. Just do this. All it's saying basically is this is empty, but then when Shiny will put its own values in. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, it will be a clean environment, so we need to um, we need to, to to load everything back in, which, as I say, I think is another advantage of doing it this way, really, because it's been done in a clean environment. I think that's good because I think when you start doing things in a in a <clears throat> in the environment you just came from, I think there's potential for kind of um, particularly with it being shiny, you might have a value that you didn't really think was in there or something, you know, it's, it's you potentially running the risk of, of, of calling a value that has a different value to what you think it does. So we're going to load the data fresh. And having done that, we can then use the parameters. So this isn't shiny anymore. This is just our markdown. <clears throat> this is how you access these values. So it's just like in shiny, really, in input dollar sign. But instead of being input dollar sign, it's params dollar sign. So whatever Shiny has told it date from is will be accessible here. Or whatever Shiny has told it date to is will be accessible here. So you can see this looks, you know, very much like the Shiny code we just wrote, except it's in R markdown language, which is params dollar sign instead of input dollar sign. <clears throat> so one thing that's worth saying is that your user can potentially make a mess with the way that we're going to set this up again for simplicity because if they don't select a trust this will be set to null because input dollar sign so over here if input dollar sign trust is empty it will be null 
then it will say it's null. So then it will set this value to null, and then it will this will be null, and then it will break. So this is a simple example. You're potentially allowing your user to generate a report which just won't work, which is not good user experience design at all. Um, you need to put something in. So what my applications usually do is when they press the button, it checks. It checks that it works first before it does anything else. And if it doesn't work, if it knows that it's not going to work, a message will pop up and say, this is not going to work. You need to do whatever it is. And then they do it and then it works. Um, but there are other ways of doing it too. Um, but I'm just saying you need to, you need to think about that kind of thing. This is obviously the, where Shiny is different from normal R programming is that you have to think about all the stuff that they could do that doesn't make any sense. Clearly, it doesn't make sense to do that, but your user doesn't know that because they just, you know, they're just clicking around. We don't expect them to know exactly how the application works. So that's it. So as I say, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but once you've got the hang of this, you'll be really good at, you know, this is this is the really, a really powerful, you know, error free way of getting our markdown out of shiny so it's uh, it's a good thing to understand so if everyone happy with that i'm gonna have a go now uh you can all have a go if you want and just ignore me or you can just have a look and see what i do is everyone happy i can see the chat so i'm gonna know if you're not happy <clears throat> cool you're all happy excellent okay right just bear with me one moment sorry while i just um sort out my various code windows, so get rid of that. Ideally, I could have three people helping me, couldn't I? I could, no, two people helping me. Me doing it, one person like checking the chat and doing all the stuff that Zoe did yesterday, and another person just faffing around with all the code windows. That would be amazing. It's probably a bit too much for one training course, really, but it would help with my stress levels. Um, <clears throat> so yes yeah, so the code you want which i'm currently finding myself is in the um so the answer is a any &E fourth folder and the helper code is in the a &E code underscore fourth so that's what i'm doing i'm just at the moment just trying to find them all <clears throat> Shiny training. So that's the helper code. So I'll just stick that on the window on the screen now, like that. Does that all fit on? It doesn't quite fit on, does it? That's annoying. Well, you've got the code anyway. It's there. It's A and E code fourth. I can't get it all to fit on the screen. Maybe if I just scroll down slightly. That's a lot of it, isn't it? And as for the so if you're anything like me and you've got in a model with your code files, you're going to want to copy the contents of A&E third, which is what I'm going to do right now, and then just write on top of it. <clears throat> A&E third is there. So pick that up, put it there. Home. And there we have it. Yes. So this is the code we wrote yesterday. Oh, actually, technically, this is the code I just wrote, isn't it? Because it's got the fluid right stuff in it. Yeah, so this is the code that I should have written yesterday, but I was actually in the wrong, wrong folder. Um, what if I make this a bit, a bit bigger, actually? My code is just so absurdly large on the screen. 
Oops, don't do that. There. Okay, cool. Right, we're going to do it. So, um, the first job is, well, let's start with the shiny first, and then we'll do the armor gun, I think. So, the first job, the simplest job, is just to add a download button. So, that's really, really easy. So, it's just this. So, the download button, let's put it underneath the trust selector. There. Okay. So, that was really, really simple. Right, next bit. Um, is this. So, I've given you this to copy because... Well, as I say, I've, I've given you all the server code to copy, haven't I, really? But as I say, I wouldn't really expect you to be able to kind of recreate this, you know, from scratch anyway. I'm certainly not capable of rewriting it without um, cheating. Oh, I've hidden the chat again. Hang on. There we go. Oh, there is a I'm glad I put the chat back up because I mean, there's in fact a question. Yeah, so the question is just for anyone who's not looking at the chat. It says, all the Shiny app is doing is passing parameters onto an R Markdown report. Wouldn't it be simple to bypass Shiny and just run the report with the parameters you need? Or am I missing the point? Sorry. Well, you're not missing the point, but the, the point of doing this is to allow people who can't write R Markdown or don't have R installed to do this in a, a simple interface. Um, so I'll show an example. So this is, so I've got people in my trust um who don't know one end of a R markdown report from the other but they have lots of other fine skills just in case anyone ever hear this they're wonderful people but they don't know anything about r um so let's just see it in action So here it is. So this is my patient experience dashboard. Let's just put the chat back up again. There it is. Um, it's still very slow, the server. I did have a tinker with it, but it's just, I don't know what's wrong with it. It's so slow. Um, yeah, so here it is. So this is, this is all these boxes here. You probably can't read it very well. Let's just maybe zoom in a little bit just so you can maybe just read a bit of the text. This is what all of, this is all powered. This is all parameterized R markdown. So this is a quarterly report that people can download. Um, and there are lots of things that they can do. So, for example, they might want to have a directory level report, and they might want to say have um, what should we do? I don't know why I'm spending so long thinking about it because it really doesn't matter. Let's download Element Health. So these are parameters within the report, and they click download report. And then a little thing pops up and says, do you want it? And you say yes. And then it should just go and appear, thusly. So like I say, so the people doing this, they can't faff around with YAML. They haven't got a clue. Um, just while we're here, let me just see if I can possibly find one. Because uh, they don't they don't always have a report every year. So let's, let's find one. Let's see if I can. Yeah, here it is. So this is a good example of the UX thing that I was mentioning before. So Arnold Lodge, some of our, it's, comp it's not worth explaining, but they don't always have a quarterly report because of the way the reporting cycle works, basically. Um, so you need to check because otherwise the user is just going to think everything's broken. So when you press that button, the first thing R does is it makes sure that there's some data in there. And if there isn't any data in there, a box comes up and it says, nope, that's not going to happen. Um, so that's just an example of that. Cool. Um, I mean, I have to say, you know, even um, even if you use a can-do parameterized R markdown, as I say, in theory, you could actually do quite a complicated thing with the parameterized R markdown. So you could even make make a shiny dashboard that even a data scientist would rely on, because you don't just have to pass reactive inputs in. You could pass anything through. So, for example, I was doing some topic modeling the other day. So you might have something that um, automatically, you know selects the right number of topics and based on that produces the right report um there isn't a there isn't a, a simple r markdowny type way of doing that 
because uh, you know you'd rely on saying, "Oh, I want six topics," and then go and then try five, and then try four, and so on and so on. Um, the way of doing that is to um, do it in shiny. So the the shiny application, based on the the values that exist at the time, it could figure out the correct number of topics and then it output that. So that's an example of a of a, an R markdown, a parameterized R markdown based on a computed value, uh, which you know even which anybody might find difficult because it's based on something that happens within the application kind of thing. Anyway, um, right. So where was I? So we've added a download button here. And now we need to make the download button work. And of course, as always, it's just output dollar sign, whatever this is, which is here. So you've got this in your obviously in your ANA code fourth, which is what's on the screen. So we're just going to put that in the server. That is just complete. That will just work out the box. So you don't need to worry too much about that. And as you can see, it puts the inputs in a list like this, which are then passed through here like this. So the only thing you really need to worry about with this is just setting the params up correctly. Everything else you can just copy, as long as you obviously keep in the cell file names. You can you could change the file names if you want, but if you do, you can have to make sure they all they all work work together. Uh, otherwise, it won't work. Um, but other than that, it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty uh, self not self explanatory. What's the word I'm looking for? It's it'll just run itself. I can't think of the word. <clears throat> So that's that. Um, once you've defined the parameters, it should work now. All we need now is we need an R markdown report at the other end of this to pick those values up and do something sensible with them. So that's what we're going to do now. So let's make a new one. So go to File, New File, R markdown. We're going to call this um, any report. Get rid of all this at the bottom. We don't want any of that. Uh, now we're going to save it. Now, as I mentioned, we've got to save it with the right name. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Where was I in here? So the name that I've caught used, as you can see over here in the um, in the download report, is report.rmd. So obviously, if you don't use that name, it will not work because it won't be able to find the file. On that, and so that's the R markdown. But we need that we need to make sure the YAML works. Um, so, oh look, I put that nice date thing in. I wish I could memorize that. I think if I, if I if I got three wishes, I think one of those wishes would be I wish I could memorize how to do a dynamic date in an R markdown report. And then we just need to just copy this in here, the parameters. So as I say, there's nothing like shiny, particularly shiny-esque about this. Um, this is just how you do it. So it's just params with a colon, and then it's indented like that. And you just set them all as NA, because as I say, shiny is going to override those values anyway. So I don't know what happens if you put values in there, but don't, because I don't know what happens. You can experiment yourself if you like. Um, so now we've set the params. That means we can now access them in the session, which is what all this is about down here. So we just need to reload. As I say, this is a clean environment. So we just need to just put everything back. Again, we need to make sure that the data files in here, otherwise it won't work. This is such a set echo equals false. I don't really want echo equals equals true. So this first chunk, we're just going to reload the packages that we need and reload the data. And then, having done that, you can then, um, <clears throat> well, let's just like this as well. Let's let's set this up in the first chunk as well. Actually, why not? So this will produce a a, a report, uh, not a report, a data frame filtered by the inputs of the application. So date from, date to, and trust. <clears throat> and then you can just do whatever you like. Uh, I'm trying to think of what might be interesting to do. Let's just do something really boring. Um, so we can say there are, is it a small R or a big R? I think it's small R, isn't it? Uh, N row, oops, report data. Um, 
rows. Oh, I didn't close the back tick. <clears throat> That's not a very exciting thing to do with our markdown, but just for the purpose of illustration. So I think that's it, right? I'm just going to make sure it works, and then I'm just going to recap for everyone, just so everyone's uh, following what I'm doing. So let's just click Run. Let's click Stop first. So there's this. So it's working OK, I think. Yeah, it's working OK. And then if we click down the report, hopefully it'll work first time. Let's see. Open. Ta-da! <laughs> there you go. Um. Obviously, there are loads of incredibly brilliant, clever things you can do with our markdown, which I'm not going to cover at all. But you can do lots of things with like formatting and you know, loads of stuff. Uh, and if you haven't been on the workshop, the R markdown workshop for NHSR, I can highly recommend it. As I mentioned earlier, it's very good. Um, so, of course, everything that you learn in R markdown you can use here. So um, this is just you know this is absolutely just out of the box. This so you can do lots of wonderful, clever things with R markdown. So that's it. So it works. I just wanted to check it works before I recap, because otherwise I'd be recapping code that I, you know, have broken. Um, so I'm just going to go from the top just to make sure I'm everyone's following me. So when we're doing our markdown reports in Shiny, there are um, it's four different things that I've shown you. Basically, the first one is the simplest one, which is you just add this this function here, download button. And download button, as I mentioned, can be used to download anything from a browser. So it's not just our markdown. You can do spreadsheets or some sort of weird and wonderful thing that I haven't even thought of. Um, it's just a way of, and again, I don't know enough about how browsers work, but it's just a way of telling the browser, I want a file. You're not sending me a web page. You're sending me a file. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing you need to know about is the bit, the server definition with the download handler. So this is the other half of the download button, basically. So whatever download button, you know, wherever this is defined, it will run whatever's in here and whatever file comes out, that's the one your browser will send to you. Um, as I say, this code, I've faithfully copied this same piece of code for probably six or seven or eight years. So I wouldn't worry too much if you don't fully understand everything that's in it. Um, the important thing to do to know really is just that you set the parameters correctly. They go in a list um, and it's a name list. I didn't say that the first time around. There you go. This is why I'm recapping because I forget to say stuff. So as you can see, the list is named like this. And these are obviously the, the these are the dollar sign values that we're going to pick up on the other side of the R markdown. And in this case, these are reactive inputs, but there's no reason why they have to be just reactive inputs. They could be anything. They could be in some incredibly elaborate computed value based on some fantastic algorithm or whatever it is. Um, and that's it for that. So once you've done that, that's the shiny bit done. That'll work. That's all plumbed in. So now you just need an R markdown file that will work. So you need to set up the params. It's done very simply here. As I say, this is not Shiny, this is just our markdown. This is just how you do parameterize our markdown. It's very useful if you haven't used it. You can use it for both purposes. Um, so it's just params with a colon, and then it's indented. Our studio should indent it for you, but if it doesn't, then uh, you should need to do that. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Set all the values to NA because Shiny is going to write over them. And then once you've done that, you can just pick them up with just params dot dollar sign. So it's just like input dollar sign, except this is our markdown world, so it's params dollar sign. And don't forget, this is a completely clean environment. So you have to recreate the whole thing from scratch. So you have to load the packages, you have to load the data. And as I say, that's deliberate and it's a good thing because it's not a good idea to just pour big sessions full of weird stuff in that you're not quite sure what it is. Um, wherever you can, it's always good to, uh, it's a bit like, um, you know, a bit like using a function, you know, you don't just import absolutely everything into the function, you execute things in a nice clean environment. 
Um, so it's kind of similar to that. And once you've done that, obviously this is very primitive, the code I've written here, but you know, once this data frame now is filtered based on a user selections and you can now do whatever you like, or you can draw a graph or whatever you might want to do. <clears throat> and that's it. Now you understand our markdown. Probably just about time for a cup of tea and a biscuit, I think. Um, biscuits are optional, obviously. Um, is everyone happy with that? Any questions? Not working for me in RStudio Cloud. You're not on the VPN, are you? I'm sure you've picked that up from yesterday. Uh, no, not on a VPN. Uh, it's the bloody cloud. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do, if you if you think it might be the cloud, I'm I'm happy enough with that. Well, I, I, I mean, I can't see how my code's any different from yours, but it just doesn't work when I click the button. So, <laughs> well, have you tr have you tried running the the actual folder? You know, with the um. I haven't. I'll do that now. Yeah, just have a go with that. I mean, that's that's a foolproof way of testing the cloud. Um. Yeah, download. Why is it doing that? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't really trust the cloud, to be honest. Yeah, uh, that that works. Um, oh, it does but, work. Oh, OK. Does the the R markdown need to be in the same folder as yes. the site that that might be that oh, yeah, come sorry. Back I that. Yeah. <laughs> no i should have mentioned that. that's a good point yeah so you can see they're all in here i mean this is obviously just being created just because i click the button yeah so you need the data and here i mean obviously you can put it somewhere else but you need to tell if you put it somewhere else you need to tell shiny where it is it's almost so always can, better can you ever have it upper together. level or does shiny just see that directory and can't see above it are you concerned? The thing about going up a level is it, it will work fine on your hard drive as long as you tell Shiny, look over there. But you 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 really setting yourself up for problems if you if you get into that habit because once you're on a server, you don't have any of that function. Sure. You know, all, all the file paths are relative, obviously, on a server. Yeah, yeah. So it's very bad habit to get into. I would just I would use relative file paths and go down. That's always because it's just a good habit. Even if you're not going to deploy it, it's just, it's a good habit to get into. That makes sense. Hmm. There's still something wrong with my code, but never mind. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely my code because uh, your example worked. Um... I mean, I can have a look for it over, over the, have a look at it over the tea break if you like. You can either share it or stick it on a gist or something. It'll be something. Yeah, sure. Do, do you want Sorry. me to share screen or would you rather just have the whole code dumped? I tell you what, let's, um, let's, hang on a minute. Let me just, I'll stop sharing. Pause the recording. Boy. Okay, now share screen. <clears throat> cool. Right, here we are. Okay. So we've learned how to um, do our markdown now, which is cool. Um, so that's very useful. Um, and the next thing we're going to learn is we're going to learn Shiny Dashboard. And I've shown this application on and off throughout the course, just because it's something that I've built that's kind of uh, a good reference. So I'm just going to bring it up on the screen now just to remind you what it looks like. So Shiny Dashboard, as I mentioned, is a package. It's a cram package. And it's largely a reskin of Shiny Dashboards, although it does have um, it does have a bit of extra functionality in, but it's it's largely the um, it's just largely the appearance of it. Sorry, the service is loading a bit slowly. So this is a Shiny Dashboard when it's finished loading. Um, 
So the things that shiny dashboards do uh, that are a bit different is first you've got these nice big box things. Some people like these, some people don't. I quite like them. Some people seem to not like them very much, but that's, you know, up to you. Um, you can change the color of them, which is quite nice. You can uh, add little icons and things to them. Um, and you can do all this dynamically. So, um, so some of these, for example, this green, orange, and red, this, that, the color of it is set statically. This number is obviously dynamic, um, but the color is static. But the color doesn't have to be static. So over here, this box is red because the criticality has got worse, and it's green when it's got better. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of stuff you can do dynamically. So that's one of the things that it adds. It adds little messages, things up here that you can get a few different types of things up here. I haven't made a lot of use of these, but you could, depending on what you're doing. So this is a little warning thing. This is just something um, I've added because this data feed changed a bit. Um, but there's a few other things you can add up here as well. So, so that could be quite neat. Um, and I think that's the main thing it does that's extra. But just gives this appearance. You can also click this to, to make it bigger as well, which is quite nice. And it draws these nice little boxes around everything as well. This is just a sort of design point. Um, and it looks a bit like a, we were looking at navbar panel, weren't we, before the break. So it's a, it's a little bit like that in that you, but instead of being along the top, you have the, the tabs down the side. So each of these buttons will um, bring up a different uh, set of uh, set of outputs. So this is essentially, this is like a sort of jazzed up uh, tab panel, really. Um, so as I say, it's largely risking, but I build everything in this because it just, um, I think the plain ones look a bit boring, don't they? So although that's the funny thing about these things, isn't it? So I've now built so many of these that I'm getting bored of these. So now I need to find something else other than that. And then I guess I'll get bored of the next thing. And so it goes on. Um, which I think that's sort of how fashion works, isn't it? Anyway, so that's, that's what Shiny Dashboard looks like. So we're going to build on now. And the way that you do it is basically like this. And this is a totally self-contained example. This is from the uh, the documentation, which is very good if you want to have a look uh, after the session. Um, the, the documentation is pretty good. So this is valid code. And if you run it, it will just produce it will produce a dashboard with the like the you know the sort of the color bit at the top and the bar and everything but just completely black um and so basically so this is the thing you know when i said about you always need a fluid page except when you don't well this is an example so instead of having a fluid page you have a dashboard page and obviously the reason for that is because uh it's got its own thing it's got the color and the you know it's got the, its own sort of design um so um it has its own function and then you have three functions the header which basically is just the thing at the top where you just write what it is um and uh that's where the little icony things go as well if you if you if you use as we're not going to look at those today but you might in the future um and then obviously you've got the sidebar which is the thing down the side and the body which is the thing there. so it's very much like a very much like a sidebar layout this except the function are a bit different and it produces me looks a bit different so that's it, basically it. That's how you do it. Um, and the thing that we looked at before, those nice uh, little color box things um, are called value boxes. Um, and there are two ways of drawing them. Uh, the first one is like this. You're probably not going to do this all that well. It's not super useful, really. And again, this harks back to the thing I was saying yesterday about <clears throat> how you, the UI only gets run once. So if you write a value box in the UI, it, it can't have a dynamic value. So anything you write in here, uh, I mean, it could have a dynamic value in the sense of it could it could refresh at load when the application loads. So for example, it could put today's date or it could count the amount of data there is on the database today or you know something like that but it can't react to the flow of the application um, and as a consequence i don't tend to use them very often because it's quite rare that you want to put something that's not reactive in one of those but you can if you want a dynamic one I keep clicking it and making the slide move if you want a dynamic one it's just like this so it's just 
it's a similar pattern to um uh the render ui so we just have a sort of placeholder a value box output which says this is going to be a value box called this but i'm not going to tell you what's in it yet and then in the server you define what's actually in it so this is very much like a ui output and then a render ui function except instead of a ui it's a value box you're generating so we're just going to take those concepts now and we're going to build something um we're going to build like a silly value box we're not going to build anything sensible in it because it obviously um it's difficult to um come up with examples you know realistic examples that involve lots of code let me just check what's on the next thing oh no that's the next bit so let's just pop this over here oops picked up the screen sharing thing again so this goes over here like this um let's get rid of that um so yes so i'm going to just as i say i don't know what you've got in your file system but i'm just going to build on top of the thing um that i just did so i just finished um adding the r markdown bit to the application um so i'm just going to carry on with that uh this window can probably get a bit smaller can't it like that um and the helper so the answer oh i'm on the wrong bit of the file system the answer is in a and e code it is in a folder called a and e code fifth which i'm not going to show you because it's on over the screen and i'm going to get myself in a model and the the helper code is in a file called a and e code fifth.r which i'll now open on my other screen and bring over um Let's just pop it out over here. And there it is, that's it basically. Again, I can't fit all the code on the screen at the same time, but you've got all this. So this is a dashboard definition. Uh, and this is the value box so we'll just add a silly value box in just to the uh just for the sake of it so i'm now going to rewrite the application that we've got so far i'm going to again rip out all the ui and replace it with a, a dashboard um and the only thing to say which i should have said and didn't so that's me uh being silly i should have made this clear in the code really so you will need to load shiny dashboard otherwise it won't work um yeah so we need to copy that library over across here otherwise it won't work i no, hidden the chat <clears throat> right everyone happy with that so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna do it now so as i say as always if you want to just have a go then feel free um or you can just have a look and see what i'm doing um <clears throat> so where to start so we'll come back to the value boxes so i'm just going to forget about them for now let's just let's just build let's just build the thing first and make sure it's all working properly and then we'll um worry about the value boxes i might just make this window a bit smaller actually just so i can uh, see what i'm doing a bit better oops oh, that's fine i'll do okay so probably the easiest way of doing this i guess is to um <clears throat> well let's do let's do it from scratch actually let's start with this just for the sake of uh, accuracy can i copy this code no never mind i'll copy it from the r markdown So I'm going to get rid of UI, get fluid page, and I'm going to replace it with that. 
Um, and now basically we're going to get all this stuff back in there. That's what we're going to do. Um, let's put the chat back up. Put that back up. Yes, right. There's nothing in dashboard header, actually. I'm going to put something in dashboard header. I don't know why there's nothing in there. Let's do that. I always forget the argument, so let me just look it up for a minute. <clears throat> yeah, it's title. I thought it was title, but I didn't want to get it wrong. So let's just call it A and E. That'll do. So that'll give us a nice title. Now the sidebar. So the sidebar, um, the way that it works is you define, um, let me just make this code a bit bigger so you can see what I'm doing. So a dashboard sidebar is here, as you can see. Um, and this basically is the way of, of, of setting up the thing that's going to select the tab panels. So if you remember when we looked at the example, well, which I've now foolishly hidden, never mind. Um, it's got those buttons down the left, which allow you to select the graphs and the tables and all, you know, the different bits of output. So that's what this bit here does. Um, so you give them a name. This is the user readable name and you give them a tab name. And this is what shiny thinks they're called. And you can give them an icon as well. That's one of the nice things about Shiny Dashboard is you can put, uh, you can put icons in things. Um, and then you, you, this matches with this output down here. So you set up the sidebar menu like this and give everything a name, graph and map. And then when, it's, when, it, when you click on graph, it will draw what's ever in here, tab name graph. And you can put as much stuff in here as you like. Similarly, when you click on map, it will draw what's ever in here. So it's a slightly different kind of layout to tab panel. It's slightly different um, because the, the tabs are defined in the sidebar. That's why it's different. They're not all defined over on the right like they were before. Um, so you set up the buttons basically on the left, give them all a name, and then it looks up the name in the dashboard body bit of the function. And you'll see here, this isn't, uh, this isn't a menu item, this, because this is just UI. So um, let's just run it, actually. That I probably should have run it in the first place, shouldn't I, just to just to show you what it is we're looking for. So you can do this yourselves if you want to as well. Um, oh, yes, it's not, sorry, it's not called A&E Fit, is it? I've called it A&E original dashboard. I've changed the names because there's a couple of versions of this. Sorry, I did should have said that before. Um, so we'll just run the contents of A&E original dashboard. And yeah, it looks like this. Did I close that code file window? Where has it gone? Yeah, there is. So as you can see, that this menu item here, that defines that. Then this defines this. And then when you click on them, it loads the contents of those things. There and there. Like that. And this input down here isn't a menu item because it doesn't relate to a piece of output over here. You just add it underneath. So it's within sidebar, but on the sidebar menu. This is a pretty default layout. You know, you'd have buttons. Well, this is what my application look like anyway. Buttons here to select the output and then inputs at the bottom. Oh, no, it's over here, isn't it? That's where it went, of course. Right. OK. So that's what we're going to do. Um, So let's do that. Right. So we got, so we've done the header. Now it's the sidebar. So the sidebar should have a sidebar menu in it. And the sidebar menu is going to define the buttons. 
We're going to give it an ID. As I mentioned, same with the tab panel. It's just a good habit. We're not going to use the ID. Um, it just means that it, later on, it's a way of, of knowing what the user's looking at, which can be useful. So it's just, uh, as I say, it won't do any harm to put it in when you don't need it. So I tend to just try and remember to put it in there. So having written sidebar menu, we then have define each of the buttons that we're going to use to select the output. So that's menu item in this case. And the first one is a graph. So the first argument is what the user sees, uh, which is just like in tab panel in common garden, vanilla shiny tab panel we saw yesterday. The first argument is the label that they click on. And then we give it a tab name. And that's what shiny thinks it's called. And you can optionally add um, an icon. <clears throat> like that. And then we're going to add another menu item. And this other menu item is going to be the map. So we're going to give it a human readable name for them to click on first, which is map. And then we're going to tell it what shiny thinks it's going to be called. Tab name equals map. And again, we're going to add an icon. I confess I don't know what that TH icon, I don't remember uh, precisely what that is, but there's obviously some sort of sensible icon in this situation. Let's just do that there. Then underneath this menu item, we're going to have um, the UI output. going to check actually that all the names are the same because I've been you've been writing on several code files for the last two days it's all going to be confusing so let's just check that this still actually is defined further down here yes there it is so it is so we're right <clears throat> so that's this sidebar panel done right let's go to that. I don't need that anymore that's from that's from the old uh, way of doing things so that's the sidebar done and now the last thing is just the body. Uh, and the body is itself going to be uh, defined with tab items that are related to the the, uh, the names that we already set up just up here. So the first one, so it's you want tab items. So the first one is going to be um, the graph one. And we're using, as I said, this name we're using here is the thing is we've already told Shiny what it's called. So we're saying whenever they click on this, show them whatever's in here. And you can have as much stuff in here as you like. And again, don't forget, you can put lots of layout functions in here as well. So all these examples are a bit simple, but you could put fluid rows and columns and all sorts of uh, all sorts of things in there if you wish to. Um, so don't forget that you can sort of mix and match like that if you wish to. Um, Right, so it's tab item. I've put quotes, which is wrong. So it's tab name equals graph. So that just tells Shiny what it is that, that we're defining. And then just whatever it is. Um, so it looks like what I've done here is I've put the graph and the trust next to each other. Um, I'll tell you what I haven't done, though, which I don't know why I haven't done it. So let's just do it now. This is one of the functions from... Um, shiny dashboard um, and it draw, it's just that nice box that I showed earlier on the dashboard that I showed you there's a nice little white box around everything which is just gives things like a cleaner appearance um, so let's put that on here why not oops that was completely wrong like that. <clears throat> okay so that's the first tab item. I don't like the way the brackets are looking, so let's just change that slightly. There we go. That's better. So that's the first tab item. And then we're going to select the other one, which is the map. And again, we're going to um, use the name that Shiny already knows about, which is map. And then we're going to put whatever the heck we like in here. And this is a box. And it's got a leaflet output in it. And... Let's just go find out what the leaflet output is called. It is called 
trust map. So we need this up here. So that's the dashboard body. That matches with the dashboard page. Yeah, so now all of this is defunct. So we recreate all that work now. So that's that done. So I'm just going to make sure it all works. And then I'll recap and just talk you through everything that I've done so, so everyone's clear and see if there's any questions. There's usually at least five minutes where I write something awful that doesn't work and spend a humiliating five minutes trying to figure out what's wrong with it. And I haven't had that yet. So I feel we're about due. So maybe this is going to be it. Oh, look, here it is one. There it is now. Um, oh, yes, I see. Yes, no, of course, I shouldn't have. Uh, I don't know why on earth I did that. I think I was just cutting classic cut and paste error there. Don't put the fluid row in there. I mean, I wouldn't have known that's what would happen, but I didn't think it was a good idea. I don't know why I did it. Um, it makes it go a bit weird like that. So don't do that. That's a terrible idea. <clears throat> Let's try again. There it is. And so if we select trust, hopefully it'll draw a nice graph for us. There we go. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it, it's not attractive. This is it really? And this is we're, we're really getting to the stage of the of the of the training course now I think where I'm starting to make pretty ugly shiny applications but I'm just I'm showing you the tools oh wow someone's not muted who's not muted I need to go and mute them oh no they've gone uh let's just check the maps working okay it is and they say you got this now little white box around things it's a bit thin, isn't it? Let's do something about that. I think um, I think they take width arguments, these boxes. Let's just... Um... Yeah, oh, I, oh, I see. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so I think the default width, it would appear, is is four, which we don't really want. So, well, let's try nine. Let's see what that looks like. That's a bit more like it. I mean, it's still not great, but I think that's a slightly more realistic example. I don't know what on earth you'd put there, but you get the idea. Cool. Okay, so that's how you do it. So is everyone happy? Any questions? I'm going to recap just to show you everything I've just done, because I know there's a lot to cover. I have got the chat open. No, everyone seems okay. Good, good. Um, right, so let's just step through it. So basically, let's just go back to the, to the, the plain one, just so you can see. So... This is what it looks like. They just I think the only thing about shiny dashboard code for me is that it gets hard to read, especially when they get a bit bigger. The dashboard body in particular gets very, very, very long. And so it can be hard to read. So I think sometimes it's good just to go back to this structure and just try and remind yourself about kind of what is in it, because you end up with, a, you know, you can end up with like 80, 120 lines of code sometimes and it can get a bit baffling. Um, but that's basically what you're doing. You're calling dashboard page instead of fluid page. And then you've got a header, which has got the title in it and those little icon things, which I'm not really covering, but you can investigate if you like. I say, have a look at the documentation. There are some little neat things you can do in there if you wish to. You've got the sidebar, which defines the buttons that you press for the output and also will have all the inputs in there as well. So I've got a date input in my example. And then body will tend to be the longest um, f function and it, just says every, basically what's in all the tabs, what's in the graph tab, what's in the map tab, and so on and so on. So just to just to show the code that I've written. So there's dashboard page. This is dashboard header. So I've added title here. But as I say, you can add those little cool icons if you wish. This is the dashbar sidebar definition. And it contains basically two things. Uh, it contains, uh, well, I suppose one thing really. It contains sidebar menu which is itself composed of menu items, which are output, uh, which are basically things that you use can click on to see different types of output. 
um, and they're all given a name. They're given a label here and a name, and then everything else can just go underneath. So the inputs, you'll tend to have a few inputs, I would think, depending on what you're doing. Um, so this is a reasonably typical example. And then once you've done that, you just have to tell Shiny what everything is. So it'll look here, it'll say, well, what's in here? And to answer that question, it goes into dashboard body, which is itself made of tab items, which is itself made of individual function calls of tab item. And it will look up the name here. So whenever it sees this, whenever the user clicks on this, they'll get this. You can put as much or as little in here as you like. And ditto when they click on this, your user will get this. And again, they can put as much or as little in here as they like as well. And that's basically it. That's how you build Chinese dashboards. Everyone okay with that? So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Um, um, we're going to do value box next. Um, I'm just I'm just thinking about time. I think we're we're running slightly early, so we can either have a lunch break and come back, or we can probably just power through it uh, and probably finish more like sort of one-ish um if people want so you can all vote on that in the chat if you like or have a think about it um because all we've really got to do left now is i'm just going to show you the the value box bit and the deployment bit so we've got an hour and 50 minutes including lunch um so uh yeah if we just push lunch back a bit i think we can probably just get through the whole thing and then you can go on your merry way so do feel free to to vote in the chat if you wish to um in the meantime Let's just go back to the um, to the value box bit. Um, <clears throat> so let's add a value box. So the value boxes will obviously tend to be in the dashboard body. Um, so let's. This is going to be a completely ridiculous example because, as always, it's hard to come up with realistic examples. So let's have one static one and one dynamic one. We'll have a static one up here um why don't we have uh well let's let's just start by writing the function value box um i'm just gonna uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna check the arguments there's no shame in checking the arguments i don't know all the arguments um yeah so value is the first thing that's the number well it doesn't have to be a number um so let's have that let's have that be a bit dynamic um okay we've got one vote for power forward okay cool um so let's have let's say the number of trusts so value equals uh length of brackets unique unique uh and i can't remember what the data is called what's the data called oh that's not in the environment is it? let's just um let's just load it so i can look at it it's a underscore attendances uh, there it is a e underscore there there it is dollar sign name and then the subtitle can it'll just be a little thing underneath that says that says what it is for the user to understand so these need to be quite short sometimes i can have a bit of difficulty although you can put line return. i'm not going to start getting into this but you can start kind of trying to get clever putting line return. i'm not going to get into all that now but just if you have that problem in the future just remember that i said that um Let's try and put an icon in as well. Um, I'm just going to guess. If this guess is wrong, uh, we can always look it up in the documentation. Um, okay, so that should work. So let's have a let's have a look. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> this is a terrible design. Should be over there, shouldn't it? That's what I should have done. Uh, Let's do that. Let's do it properly. Do it properly for once, Chris. Let's write a box. 
width equals three, comma, there, that, sh that should look a bit more like it. Oops. Oh, <laughs> I wonder if it'll look any better if I, uh, oh yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm not gonna spend ages faffing around with that. I don't quite know why it's doing, why is it looking so, why is it making such a horrible mess of it though? I don't quite understand why it's not, maybe it's just not a good idea to put it in a box, I suppose. You'd think it would handle it better than that, though, wouldn't you? I don't know. I'm not going to spend too long thinking about that. But um, other than the horrible mess it's made of the squash window, that's a, that's a more logical way of laying it out. Um, maybe it's because it's already a box, I suppose. Um, I wonder if I could be cheeky and just replace it with a column. I don't think this will work, but let's just find out. No, it doesn't like that, does it? Interesting. Oh, unless... Oh, yes, of course. No, no yeah, I'm doing it the wrong way around. Oh, no, that's the problem. Sorry, I should have thought of that. That's me being silly. Um, yeah, set the width there. That's what I should have done. I'm setting the width inside something that's already got width, that's the problem, that's why it's making him it... my fault, not Shiny's fault, to be fair. No, I've messed it up now. Uh, I think I've got too many brackets, haven't I? Tab item. Yeah, I think it's that actually. There we go. Right, sorry, yeah. Of course the width goes inside there, not not outside. I'm silly. There you go. That's a reasonably uh, sensible uh, layout for it, I think, isn't it? So that's that, value box. As you can see, it's sort of dynamic based on the state of the application when it loads, but it's not reactive. So let's make a reactive one now. Um we'll put this on the on the on the map just for fun. Um, let, let's, let's, um, let's set the width properly again and, uh, yeah, like this and then value box output, whoops, value box output. So it's just a name this time, just like with when we're doing a rend, a dynamic UI, we only need a name. We don't need a label because that will come later. So let's call it, um, what should we call it? Map box UI. And then we just need to define that in the server bit down here, output dollar sign. Oops, wrong button gets render value box. And again, just like render UI this, it's just perfectly common garden value box now. So I'm just going to copy this just to get the, the arguments and stuff right, but we'll just change it slightly. And let's just have something, this is just going to be totally stupid. This is not a sensible thing at all, but just to illustrate the point that you can have reactives in there. Subtitle equals trust selected. We'll leave the icon. They're quite fun, the icons. Have a look at the documentation. There's loads of different ones you can get. Uh, again, it's not a shiny thing. This is like a web thing. So you, you're drawing on quite a large number of web um, kind of resources uh, to build this kind of stuff. Um, so that should be width four because we've got eight here. So don't forget it's add up to 12. So this is back to that bootstrap thing that we talked about yesterday. Was that yesterday or this morning? This morning. 
that's it. So let's just make sure it all works, and then I'm going to recap, and then we'll just uh, we'll finish up the day, and you'll probably be on your way by about one-ish. <clears throat> Yeah, the UI is, I mean, this is terrible, isn't it? Because the, the trust selector is now on a different, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Not attractive, but you get the idea. Um, yes, the, the, yeah, so the, the, the text is quite massive. So it's, it's more for smaller. It's not really designed for massive things like this, really. This, I'm just illustrating the point. Um, so that's funny boxes. They are quite fun. Uh, you can you can make them interactive as well, actually. Um, I don't really have time to uh, to go into that, but that's just another thing that you might want to just remember. Um, so that could be quite useful. You could have like a, a red button or whatever, and they click on it, and it'll tell them something more about why the button's red as opposed to orange or whatever it is. <clears throat> right. That's that. Uh, oh, yes, I said I'd recap. Now let's just quickly recap. So value boxes, very simply, you can give them a width, which I messed up. So that was a deliberate mistake on my behalf to show you what happens if you mess it up. Um, and they have a value, which is just a big thing, like tends to be like a number or something like that. Um, and then a, a subtitle, which will just show the user, like, what is this thing that I'm looking at? And you can add an icon as well. Which is quite fun uh, and you can also make them dynamic and it's it's exactly the same code pattern as it is for render ui it's just a different function so it's value box output then it's just defined down here and this inside here this code is just totally ordinary value box code the only difference being that you can now access reactive values as here so that's it so you can now make some pretty cool shiny dashboard um applications with what i've told you Everyone happy? Excellent. Right. Well, do shout up if you're not. Um, oh, very happy. That's good to hear. There is an evaluation coming out. Uh, I think Charlotte meant to. I don't. She might possibly just pop in any minute uh, and drop it in the chat. But if she doesn't, I think it'll go by out by email. So I'll just mention that now. So please do fill in the evaluation and you be as brutal as you like. I've done this course loads of times, like, I don't know, six or seven. I've had some, I haven't had a lot of feedback ever, really. The feedback I tend to get is either, yes, it was fine. Or sometimes people say it was too hard, um, which is, you know, totally valid. Um, it's, it's hard to pitch this because... Um, as you probably noticed throughout the two days, it's difficult to teach just shiny. That's what I find difficult. Other stuff creeps in um, and that I find that difficult to manage. Um, perhaps because I'm terrible at doing this. I don't know. Um, but do let me know. I'm Be brutal. I can take it truly. Don't worry about it. If you think there's anything wrong with it, then please tell me. Um, OK. Right, last bit. OK, so let's just make the window big. I think that's all the code that we're going to write now. So you can all relax now, I think. Um, right, so I've got two more things to talk about. It was only going to be one, but Alex very helpfully mentioned data, which I think is an increasingly interesting question these days because there are so many different ways of, of doing stuff now. Um, so deployment. So people, people are at really different stages with deployment. That's, as you'll all know. Um, some trusts are just be beginning you know they've got shiny on some guy's laptop like that's as far as they've got and some trusts have got you know cloud r studio server and r studio connect and they've got all this stuff so depending on where you are will very much depend on what you take from this next section but i'm going to try and tell you everything i know about deployment and i regularly talk to people all over the country about this um so uh and if you yeah if you've got any questions about it um then please do drop me a line you can find me on slack or you can find me on twitter or email or whatever i'm sure you'll find me somewhere just come and shout at me on twitter um so if people have got r which is a sort of fledgling like we're just trying to get this thing working if you're working with other data scientists or whatever it's really easy to distribute shiny that's that's very easy 
um, and there are some neat functions to do it. So this is quite a neat function, run GitHub, uh, and this will work. This if you put it in your in your console, it will work. You just this is the obviously the a person. This is a person's GitHub repo. This is obviously me, and this is the name of a repo in that GitHub. And Shiny will it's a Shiny function, and Shiny will automatically go to the go to the GitHub, download everything, all the data, all the code, everything, and just run it. Um, so that's quite neat. Um, there's run URL as well, which is useful if something is hosted on a file server. So uh, it definitely works with zips. I don't know if it works with anything else. I'd have to read the documentation. I can't remember. But certainly if you are doing something like that, if you might you might be behind like a firewall and have like a file server or something like that, you could just zip it all up and use that. Uh, and this is quite useful as well. Run gist. This is, I don't know if everyone knows about gist. Um, it's a GitHub thing that's just for very simple. Um, it's not like a big full feature thing like GitHub. It's just for like a few code files kind of thing. Uh, and again, this example will actually run. Let me run it for you. I built this years, like eight years ago. And it, I'm pretty sure it still runs. Let me just run it for you and show you. The quotes are all screwed up in the uh, in the slide, which is a bit annoying. So I'm just going to change them into proper quotes. Why does it work? So if you run this, uh, it'll produce this. This is just a nice, I built this years and years and years ago. Uh, it's just a way of um, just showing people some of the different types of uh, inputs that there are in Shiny and um, how they all work. So you, as you look over here, you can see as I'm pressing stuff, uh, it's updating what it is. And it tells you the type as well. I sort of built this to help other people, but quite honestly, I sort of built it to help myself because when you're writing Shiny, sometimes you get a bit confused as to what everything is. And so having a big bank of buttons and stuff that you can play with and look at the values and look at the type, I found quite useful. So look, for example, here, this is kind of, so this control is returning null. It's not returning like three falses or anything. It's returning null. And then you click something and it returns that. You click this and it returns that. So. That kind of thing. So there you go. So you can run that if you like. Um, and the last way of getting it to run on people's computers who've already got R is, and this is quite a common thing that you can do that I suggest to people, is just get some sort of network shared area thing and just put it there and you can all just get it. Um, so that's pretty easy. Sharing our applications with people who use R is, as you wouldn't, you know, as it will come to no surprise, not that difficult. Uh, but that is very rarely enough. Um, so once that's not enough, you get into the realm of servers. Um, and there are lots of things to say about this. Um, the easiest way, I think, of getting into this world is using shinyapps.io, which is a paid service. They have a free tier, but it's a paid service uh, from our studio, which is in the cloud. And it's dead easy because you just press a button and you put your account details in and it will deploy stuff for you. So it's really, really easy and cool. The only problem with it is that it's all A, it's in the cloud and B, I'm almost positive that the servers are not in Europe and therefore you, you're very limited as to what you can put in it. Very limited indeed. So sometimes people use it because they like have built like a demo. They want to just kind of like show the principle of something. So it's good for that. It's good for demos of like, hey, look at this thing that we could do. But it's no use at all for production, really. Um, I mean, we've got stuff in the cloud. So our patient experience data, which I've been showing throughout the course, is all in, it's all just open in the cloud. Because it's patient experience data, it's not identifiable. And we want people to read it. It's all just there. So that would be an example of when you can use the cloud for production. But in a lot of cases, as you'll all know, the cloud is, is no use for production, really. Um, so that's that. Uh, so then if you... If you need to secure your data in some way, it, then it gets more complicated again. Um, so the first thing to say is that um, if you're putting in particular types of data, patient data or whatever, you're probably going to have to control the server yourself. You're probably not going to be able to use a, a, a paid server. Well, unless you couldn't, you might be able to pay for someone and, and get them to to validate it all for you and put it in, and you know, service in this country and all that kind of stuff. Um, but at a certain point, you're probably going to want to put it behind your firewall. Um, and even if you do put it behind your firewall, you're still going to need to secure 
the uh, the data flows as it goes around. Um, so Shiny Server uh, is free. The open source version of it is free. And I did use it for years. I don't use it anymore because I just use RStudio Connect now. But I did use the free version for years. And you could run the free version for free behind your firewall. And nobody outside your firewall would be able to see what you were doing. However, there would be no encryption. There would be no security based on that data. So basically, anyone behind the firewall will be able to see everything that you're doing, which is very often not what you want. Um, so depend, you start to get into needing to know more and more about kind of the way that the web sort of stuff. But basically, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about HTTPS, secure socket layer encryption. Um, HTTP requests through the open source version of Shiny Server are not encrypted. They're visible to the whole network. Uh, and that's no good in a lot of cases. Um, so you can use Shiny Proxy. People often say to me, I want to do this for free. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, there are two ways of doing it for free. Number one is using Shiny Proxy, which is free, which offers HTTPS and logging, lo not logging, login and authentication and all that kind of stuff. It's Java based. You run it on the server. I don't use it. I have never used it. I will never use it because I'm terrified. Because if I put it on the server and say, oh, it's all secure and fine, and then it breaks for some reason and all the data just gets leaked all over the firewall, I will be sacked. So I don't use it. But if you know what you're doing, go for it. It's free. It's there. It, you know, apparently it works. So I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying I never have because I just I don't understand these things well enough to risk it, frankly. But it's it, it's an option and it is totally free. The other thing you can do if you know what you're doing, which I don't, is you can set up some sort of proxy authentication. So you don't have to authenticate Shiny if you don't want to. What you can do instead is build some sort of authenticated web type environment, either using probably either using Apache or Nginx, which are for those uninitiated are basically just web servers, um, and put the Shiny behind that. So make it so you can't get to the Shiny without going through this proxy authentication. And again, if you know what you're doing, great, go for it. I'm sure that will work very well, um, but I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And I wouldn't do that because if it broke, then I would get you know into trouble. So I don't do that, but you can. <clears throat> so that's the sort of free do-it-yourself options, which are there. And then if, you, um, if you're like me and you don't know what you're doing, then you're probably going to want to pay for it. Um, Shiny Pro. I'm going to mention just because I think people might have heard of Shiny Pro. They still, R Studio support Shiny Pro. It's it's, a, it's an R Studio product. It's paid. I think if you've already got it, they will carry on supporting it for now. They will carry on selling it to you, but they don't provide it anymore. They won't give it to you because it's deprecated, basically. Um, so if you haven't already got it, it's too late. You never will. Uh, which means that the paid option remain that remains to you is R Studio Connect. Um, I don't want to sound like a salesman for our studio, so um, I'm going to try and be a bit, um, I don't want to be too over enthusiastic, but our studio connect is very, um, it's not super easy to install in my, well, again, it is very easy to install, but it's not very easy to install by me because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but it was harder than Chinese Pro basically, uh, but it, you know, if you know what you're doing, it's not that difficult at all, I'm sure. Um, it's very good for two reasons, really. The first reason why it's really good is because it doesn't require, once it's installed, everyone can use it without interacting with the server. So I've got people in my team who deploy R Markdown and Shiny. They've got no clue how the server works. It, they don't, it doesn't matter. They just click, there's a little blue button and you just click it and you can just deploy stuff. Um, so that's really useful. Shiny Pro, that wasn't the case. Shiny Pro, you had to faff around and put the files in the right place. And I was the only person who knew how to do that which meant it was, it was a pain in the neck. So that's the first reason why our Studio Connect is awesome. The second reason why our Studio Connect is really awesome is because it handles your package dependencies for you cleanly. Um, so what that means is when you click the deploy button, uh, it, it deploys your exact version of all the packages. So we used to get in a mess back in the days when we used Shiny Pro. There was a classic thing that happened where TidyR, there was some breaking changes in TidyR. And we found that some people were using the new version, some people were using the old version. It took us a very, 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 very long time indeed to figure out what the problem was. But Shiny Pro only, you could only use one version of all the packages. Um, so um, 
R Studio Connect, you don't have that problem. It just deploys your version of the packages. So you don't have to worry about like package dependencies. Everyone's got their own. It's your version of R as well. So if people are using different versions of R, that's all done for you as well. So that's quite neat. Uh, we can get a discount uh, from R Studio. So if you mention that you're NHS, um, if you are NHS, I'm not really sure. I don't, to be honest, I don't know. I haven't really spoken to anyone who's not in the NHS, but is in NHSR who spoke to our studio. I don't know precisely what the criteria for the discount is now I think about it. Um, but you can just flag it with them and ask them about it. And um, if they don't know what you're talking about, you're probably just talking to the wrong person, in which case, uh, just let me know. And I'll, I'll find the person who does know what, uh, and I'll just put you in touch. Um, so that's our Studio Connect. It's not super expensive, but there is a cost to it. Um, but we use it in my trust, and I, I'm very, uh, very, uh, it's, you know, it's good experience for us. And the last thing, just to mention, which I've sort of touched on throughout, but just to flag it because this is one of the first conversations we have with people who want to understand this stuff, is you. The first thing you need to decide is where the server is. I mean, you, I've got two servers, one in the cloud, one behind the firewall. Um, and, you know, you can do that. But yeah, so if you've only got one server, you need to think you need to think carefully about where it is. So if it's behind the firewall, it's a lot safer because it's behind the firewall, which is great. But if it's behind the firewall, it means you, nobody else can see it. So that can be problematic in terms of, you know, like obviously cooperating with other trusts. Or, so I do some projects either in the ICS or nationally where people, other people want to see what we're up to or use it or whatever. And in those situations, a firewall server is absolutely no good whatsoever. I think in theory, I don't know a huge amount about networks. In theory, your NHSI team, I think, could somehow open a port from behind the firewall to get out of the internet to let them, but they will never do that because they would, they're just producing an attack surface for hackers. So they would never do that. If something's firewalled, as far as I know, in the NHS, that's it, tough. No, there's, no, there's no coming in or, or, or going out. Um, so you just need to have to think about that. Um, right, so that's deployment. And I've just added this slide just right now, just based on something that Alex said. Um, so forgive the, the slightly off the cuff nature of it, but it was a good question and I thought it probably deserved me discussing it now and remembering to discuss it in the future next time I do this course. So there are lots of ways of loading data in Shiny applications, and there is no one right way. You have to think carefully about how much data there is, how long it takes to access it, whether it's going to annoy the other person if you do access it, like is it an API or something. Um, all manner of things. There's lots of interlocking factors that affect how you do things. Um, again, thinking in terms of your journey, as a shiny developer, you will probably will start off either with a, just a CSV that you just, this is my data file, it's in the folder. Uh, or you might do some pre-processing and save it as an R data file. That's what we tend to do. I don't really like, I don't really like loading spreadsheets. I prefer to put them in an R, in an R thing because I just, it just means if you share them, there's no, um, you know, like sometimes people load it and it doesn't look quite the same on the spread, you know, that kind of thing. Just clean it have our data and you go, this is the R data. It looks exactly like this in my session. It looks exactly like that in my session. So personally, I tend to prefer our data as soon as possible, just in terms of sharing and stuff like that. There's the pins package. That's another R Studio thing. It's very, very useful indeed with R Studio Connect for various boring reasons that I won't go into that you won't care about unless you're an R Studio Connect license. Um, but it's not just for our studio connect it does lots of neat things and it does lots of neat things in shiny as well it has the concept of like a reactive data source so the pins package is really good at listening to various data sources and seeing if they change so it, it all it, like it, it's a sort of reactive data load if you like so it'll load something and then it will listen out for if the data changes and if the data changes it will update itself so that's really useful so, so have a look at the pins package. It, it does. I don't use all the functionality, but there's, there's some quite good stuff in there. And the last thing to mention um, is, and obviously this is a big important thing for a lot of us, is SQL. Um, so you can, and again, this is where judgment comes in. You can run your session, your, your shiny session. In fact, we talked about this yesterday with the, with the reactive data load. 
you can, if you wish, put a, a SQL operation inside a reactive expression. And if you do that, every time your user changes one of the inputs to that reactive expression, it will hit the, hit the SQL database. And that's a really good idea if you want 500 rows out of 20 million each time the user's doing it. However, you're going to want to talk to your BI team because I know there are, to be honest, I don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't work in like, I'm not a DBA, so I don't fully understand all these things. But basically, the message I always get is, please don't hit this d database all the time because it's busy and it's got better things to do than serve your ridiculous queries. So sometimes they will say, we don't want you to be doing that. We don't want you to set up a reactive thing where you're hitting the database every 90 seconds. That's really annoying. Can you please cache it? So I'm doing it for one of my projects, for example, at the moment. I think instead of having a reactive expression, which would just hit the database over and over and over again, what we're doing instead is we're doing it, we're doing it overnight because they don't tend to mind what you do overnight, really, as a rule. Um, and then I think we load it twice more during the day just to... Um, to minimize the load base. So we've got a, as much data as we need, but no more, because otherwise the BI team will get upset with us because we're wasting the service time. So I think that's all I know about deployment and, and data. Is there any questions on those things in particular? There's a question in the chat about DLL files, which I, I mean, I know it's not particularly to me, but I just to say, I don't know. I have seen that question, but I don't know anything about it. Um, DLL I thought was Windows, so I don't know. I'm not sure I really understand the question, the the, uh, the background to the question. Um, and yes, that's the word I haven't used throughout this whole thing actually, which is just reminding me is that what once you get into the if you get into the world of R Studio Connect and all that kind of stuff, and if you have a server, that server will run Linux. There is there is no choice in that. There are no other server specifications available for any of their products. So if you're going to maintain it yourself, if you're going to have any interactions with it or whatever, you will need to know a bit of Linux. In my personal opinion, the NHS should, not every single person, but I think there should be data, sci data scientists who know Linux, partly for this reason and partly for some other reasons. Uh, but as I'm sure, as most of you know, Linux support in the NHS is pretty bad. Although some, some trusts, interestingly, do have Linux teams totally separate from the data science team. So I've come across that, which is quite interesting and it's quite useful. Um, but yes, in my opinion, I think data scientists could usefully learn that. Not so they can, you know, support 25, so, you know, not so they can do loads of, but just in case it breaks or something simple happens, they, they've got some help of, uh, a bit like maybe learning how to, you know, fix your car. Like you wouldn't expect you to like strip the whole engine and put it back together again. You'd get a professional to do that, but at least you can like, whatever change the oil. Well, I'm absolutely used to the car, so it's not a great analogy for me, really, but whatever that people do, people do that stuff, I don't know. Right, that's it. I can't see anything in the chat. I don't know what the last slide is, so let's find out. I think it's probably ex a bonus material. Yes. So this is more bonus material. Um, oh, yes, I was going to show you the interactive thing as well, wasn't I? I'll just do that quickly, because I know you're probably all wanting lunch. Um, and we've, we've powered through rather than having a lunch break. Um, so this is just some suggestions for stuff you can do, as I say, if you want to just kind of like deepen your understanding of the stuff that we've, uh, that we've done. Um, so you can just have a bit of a tinker and put value boxes in all this kind of stuff. Uh, and you can have a look at interactivity as well, if you wish. And there is, there is an exact, that's partly the other reason why I've done this is so you've got the code. So if you go away and look in this repo, if you look in the bit that says interactive, you'll see all this stuff. Um, so let me just show you now and then we'll we'll finish up. So I'll bring my other window back across now. This is the this is the repository window, which I can't use normally because I'm going to wipe over it. Here. Right, let me just show you what it does. I'm just going to quickly talk you through the concepts. So I'm not really trying to teach you this because it is far too hard for for this level of course really. Um, but it's um, it's good to know and it's good to see and it's good to have the code. <clears throat> so this is what it does. Let's just make it work first. So um, it 
Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. I was like, why is it not working? No, it's the map that's interactive. Yeah, so the map is interactive. So uh, you can click here. Now you can see the pointer changes. So you can click here and a little thing pops up with some information. I mean, this is not, you know, it's only silly. Obviously it does not, I don't think you'll actually build this, but it's just of interest. So a little box pops up and shows you more information and it draws a graph over here as well. So this, if you see the graph is based on the thing that you're clicking. And not only that, you can actually interact with the graph as well. So this is interacting with the map. This is interacting with the graph. So if you just look, if I just hover over, you can see underneath the graph, when I hover over a point, it tells you tells you what that point is. Again, that's pretty pointless, isn't it, really? Um, but I'm sure you would have a real world example for this that might um, might be worth doing. So that's what it does. So I just want you to know that's possible, really, rather than expecting you to run away and do it tomorrow. I'm just going to quickly talk you through the code, which, as I mentioned, is not not super easy to understand, to be honest with you. But let's just see some of the some of the basic um, some of the basic concepts. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just have a look at how you interact with the plot, not the plot. I said the wrong thing. The map. So this is the map here. This is the output bit of the map. So let's just go and find it down here. And it's here. Observe event. Now we haven't really covered this because there's just there isn't there's only so much time. Um, this is a way. This function basically is a way of 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 listening out for something. So this observe event function will listen out for this whatever you put here. And this this is is defined by Leaflet. So Leaflet exports this input. You don't have to set it up yourself. And it's just this is just what it's called. If you remember, that's what it's called down here uh where's it gone the leaflet oh yeah here it's there so it's just this name with underscore marker click and it is quite obviously the marker click that's what it is um and the marker click will contain basically coordinates so that's what this is doing it's saying take the coordinates in inside this and put them in here and it also this contains uh, dollar sign ID contains the thing that it is. So it, the, 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 the label like the the um, the, the trust. Um, and then having done that, I won't go into all this, but this is just basically this is leaflet code. So this is just a way basically of, uh, this is this is the function that adds the pop up. So it just says based on the location that we just figured out and based on the name of the thing which as you can see is uh, is 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 generated here um, just print a nice pop up so that's that basically you're just listening out for this so that's how you make a, a, a map interactive that's the first thing to learn and the second thing is once we've done that uh, a graph appears and so the graph is here this is a nice instance of the require function you remember this from yesterday so what this is saying is don't try and draw this graph until they've clicked because there's no point because there's nothing to draw. If you don't, I think if you don't include that, you get a nasty red arrow message. Um, you may not do, but it's, sometimes it's nice to put them in just in case. Um, and again, it's similar again. You just, you, you're kind of doing the same thing again. So you, you, you're figuring out what, what's in that click, filtering based on it, and then draw a graph. So that's that. Basically, the concept here is just listen out for this with the require function. And then once you've got it, figure out what it is and draw a graph of it like that. So that's that. And then we're still not finished. There's one more thing, which is if we go back up to here, you can see this is the graph. This is the thing that's drawn optionally when they click. It's called one graph. And you can see the way that we enter our interactivity to this is with the hover argument. And there's a few of these. It's not just hover. Let's just bring the documentation up to show you. So there's hover. There is click, double click, and brush. And they obviously all define different things that your user might do with a plot. So for us, it's if they hover over it, but we can also have it. Have they clicked it? Have they double clicked it? Or brush is like you know when you draw like a like a box and you drag a. a a box around something that's what brushes um 
So when it says hover equals plot hover, what that does basically is it sets up an event that we can listen for called plot underscore hover. And then having done that, we can then go down here and we can see how it's used. And it's just this thing here again. So plot hover is here. This is a bit complicated. I'm not, I'm probably not going to go through all this because it probably just baffle everyone, but basically near points is, is a way of, uh, it's a way of, um, figuring out what's close to what the, the reason why I use near points is because your user probably hasn't clicked on the very precise pixels that the, that the thing is. So near points is just, and that's what the threshold is, is saying, how accurate do you need them to be? So it's just a way of saying they've clicked the graph roughly where did they click? That's what the near points is doing. And then all this is doing really is just figuring out what they clicked um, and pulling out some information about it and then just writing it down here. So I say that's a whistle stop tour. But do have a browse through the code. I'm sure you'll find it interesting and hopefully you'll come back to it and uh, and do some neat interactivity stuff. Oh, uh, what shortcut using? Good question. So it's just F1. So you just put your um, put your pointer on the function somewhere and just press F1. <clears throat> right, that's the end of the course. I'm going to click stop record now. Then I'll just do questions.